pyramids of Egypt were built to protect the bodies of the pharaohs so they could resurrect and live forever in the next world. The high point of pyramid construction took place 4,000 years ago at Giza, near modern-day Cairo. The Great Pyramid of Cheops is the largest pyramid ever built and is about 450 feet high, built of two and a half million blocks of stone, some weighing as much as 70 tons. This structure contains more stone than all the cathedrals ever built in England. To further protect the dead, elaborate rituals, including mummification, were developed. The Egyptians built rock-cut tombs, decorated with scenes of the gods welcoming the deceased to the netherworld. Sometimes, Anubis, the jackal-headed god of embalming, is shown leaning over the mummy, preparing the body for eternity. Elaborate coffins covered with hieroglyphs were constructed to protect the mummy for the journey to the west. The spells on these coffins assure the deceased would have clothes and anything else necessary in the next world. Pets were also mummified so the ancient Egyptians could enjoy their companionship in the netherworld, just as they did in this life. About two-thirds of the human body is water, and every body, human, animal, contains bacteria. When we die, the bacteria, combined with the water, combined with the tissue, causes putrefaction. The body starts to decay and ultimately falls apart. There are two basic ways of stopping this decay. You can kill the bacteria, perhaps by heat, or you can remove the water in the body, totally dehydrate it, and then the bacteria won't be able to act on the tissue. In modern funerals, what a mortician does is he uses a combination of these two procedures. He removes some of the moisture from the body, he drains the blood, and then he adds chemicals which kill bacteria. The ancient Egyptians preferred to try desiccation, to try to totally dehydrate the body so the bacteria could not act on the tissues. The first embalmer was the Egyptian desert, and the first mummies were natural mummies. When a body is placed in the dry sand, it dehydrates naturally, preserving it. The sands of Egypt contain thousands of mummies, and in some places, mummy bandages and bones litter the surface. The very first mummies were these sand mummies, created by the same process that turns grapes into raisins. If the moisture can be removed, anything can be preserved. Another method of preserving is what is done to fish by placing them in salt to draw out the moisture and dehydrating them, they're preserved. This is the method that the Egyptians used. They used natrin, which is a naturally occurring salt. It's sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium chloride, baking soda plus table salt. And they took this naturally occurring salt and immersed the body for 35 days in it to dehydrate it. If you were wealthy, you could have your internal organs taken out and salted separately. But basically, it was dehydration by using this salt. When Herodotus, a tourist who went to Egypt in 450 BC, described this process, the word he used, the Greek word he used, is the same word they used for salt drying fish. The amazing thing about mummies is that they're still recognizable human beings after 3,000 years. If you knew them when they were alive, you'd say, there's Tutmosis II. There's Ramses the Great. Although a great deal has been written about mummification, the practical details are still unknown. If you do a mental mummification, if you try to just think about how you would do it, practical problems arise. How exactly do you remove the brain through the nose without damaging the face? Or how do you remove all the internal organs through an abdominal incision this big, less than four inches? The liver is a very large organ. The only way to figure out how the Egyptians actually did it is to actually do a mummification. Experimental Egyptology is the way to go. One of the things we were going to need was a facility where we could perform the mummification. We were fortunate. The medical school of the University of Maryland invited us down to use their facility, which had everything we needed. In addition, Ron Wade, the director of the State Anatomy Board, offered to help, and he was both a licensed mortician and had a lot of experience, hands-on experience, with working with cadavers. The medical school built a special room where we could keep the body in its nature for 35 days. 
the temperature and humidity were controlled, so it would be very much like the Valley of the Kings. High temperature, low humidity. So we had the facility we needed. What we next needed was an embalmer's board, the kind of board that the ancient Egyptians used to place the mummy on it, immersed in the natron. In 1922, Herbert Winlock, an excavator, found such a board in Egypt in a tomb. It had been dismantled and placed with the deceased after the mummification. We had photos of that board, and we had the exact measurements of it. What we next needed to do was to build an exact replica. Sneferu has its light been done. Now I'm a little bigger than the average Egyptian, but not radically. Now which this is from what century exactly? Well this embalming board is 2000 BC. It's a middle kingdom embalming board. And I'll tell you, it might be good for the dead. It's not good for the living. Ooh. We'll also need surgical instruments similar to those used by the ancient Egyptians. Our tools were replicas of those found by excavators in Egypt. A silversmith made all the tools we thought we would need, including a curved tool for removing the brain. We'll also need ceramic vessels to store the unguents, the oils, the natron, the spices, all the things we'll be using in the mummification. The other reason we'll need jars, these are called canopic jars, are for the internal organs. As we take out the internal organs from the cadaver, they'll be dehydrated and then placed in these canopic jars to be stored forever with the deceased. The largest the jars, we, jars we would use were those to store the natron. We labeled them in hieroglyphs, natron. The smaller, colorful jars were the canopic jars used to hold the internal organs of the deceased. These had lids shaped like the four sons of Horus. The human head was mesty. The jackal was Duamatef. Happy had the head of an ape. And the last jar, with a lid shaped like a falcon, represented the god Ketsunebeth. The main ingredient we need for the mummification is the natron. For that, we're going to have to go to Egypt, to the Wadi Natrun, where the ancient Egyptian embalmers went to get their natron. But we'll also need the spices, the frankincense and myrrh, that they used in the preparation of the body. For that, we'll go to Hana Halili Bazaar, the spice market in Cairo. Now this is the... No, 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 no. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. This is Frankenstein. Laban Hang on.
In ancient times, this place was called the Field of Salts, but in modern times it's called the Wadi Natrun, the riverbed of Natrun. Natrun occurs naturally in the soil here, but when the water level of the lakes rises, the natrin goes into solution. Then, when the water eventually recedes, the natrin is deposited on the banks of the lakes. Now, Bob, how much of this would it take to, for, to make a mummy, you think? It would probably take at least 400 pounds to do a mummy, maybe more. Uh, we don't know whether the embalmers change the natrin or not. They just leave it for 35 days, or perhaps they left it for 15 saw how much it could absorb and then replaced it with fresh matron. We really don't know that for sure and that has to be determined empirically. After years of preparing, after getting the matron, making the surgical tools we need, the ceramic jars, we're finally ready for the mummification. So on a May morning in 1994, we all assembled the team, the instruments, the ingredients, all of us, at the University of Maryland's Medical School to perform the mummification. The body we used for the project was of an elderly male who had donated his body to scientific research. Egyptians did not preserve the brain when they removed it. They broke it down and drew it out through the nasal passages, leaving the face undamaged. down to the sixes, okay, down six or 5.8 or something like that. And that's when you get the stiffening. 
then as the body starts, the putrefaction starts taking place, then you have nitrogen compounds and ammonia compounds building up in the body, you have the swelling, the gas created, and that's when it starts turning flaccid again. So you can kind of look at the cause of time and death that way too. But if you get somebody that's been dead for a long time, mm -hmm. they're not stiff, they're flaccid. Because they wanted to leave the body looking as intact as possible, the Egyptians removed the internal organs through a very small abdominal incision. placed in the room, the embalmer's board had to be set up. In the same room were the large storage jars that held the natron, the canopic jars that would eventually hold the internal organs, and 365 Ushapti figures, magical statues, one for each day of the year, that the Egyptians believed would come to life and serve the deceased in the next world.
fuck and then draws behind it if it moves. <clears throat> under it even. Yeah, put the jaw with the stomach under it. It's a, it's a little... Thank you. 
swab and rubbing down where the rectum was and the bladder, especially down the rectum where the large intestine was. And to get a culture, see if anything grows, see if there's any anaerobic, or anaerobic meaning like the in gangrene, or aerobic, like the coli bacteria. Yeah. 
this bandage says the Osiris, because every dead person was associated with Osiris, the god of the dead. The Osiris N, that's his name, Osiris N, John Doe, born of Jane Doe, Maharu, true of voice, which means he was judged to be true of voice in the next world and admitted to the next world to immortality. So that's a typical funerary bandage. Okay. We got two more hands here. I'll work on okay. Yeah. It's now oil. Yeah. It's been perfumed and now it's going being wrapped. I'm going to place it inside the jar. Now which jar is that? This is the jar with the head of an ape who is happy. Now, this one is barely going to fit. You have to. Come down again. Now, what we're trying to do is put the temporary 
your tithes on the money so that we'll have it, everything in place, the linen will be in place on top for the final damages which are going to go across for each tithe pretty much. This is the uh, money we're trying to replicate that most of the third and see if we can get the bandages in the same place. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bandages that go across. You got one? If any, you, want, if you want a string, I'll cut you a string line. I see what's going on now, I understand. I can tell. I've got scissors, I see it's thin. procedures the embalmers used, how did they remove the brain, how did they remove the internal organs. And the third thing was, how did they use the matron, how much was necessary, and where was it placed. In the end of the project, we had learned about all three. In the area of the tools, we probably had our biggest surprises. One thing was that the bronze tools that the ancient Egyptians had were not the best for them to use. We made replicas of the bronze tools, exactly of the same materials that they had. We used 88% copper and 12% tin just like the Egyptians. And when we started preliminary work with these tools, we learned that they dulled very quickly. And ultimately, when we made the abdominal incision, it was with the obsidian flake, volcanic glass is what we used, not with the bronze tools. Herodotus, a tourist who had described this procedure, said they used a sharp Ethiopian stone, meaning a black stone, obsidian. And we always thought that they used it for ritual purposes. But it wasn't for ritual purposes that they were using stone. It was the best implement. The other area that we learned about the tools was there's a tool that had a little notch in it, a bronze tool that everybody had always called the necrotome, the death knife, which they assumed was used by the embalmers because it could be used to, with one hand. If you could slip one hand inside the abdominal cavity, move it around, it might be useful. But when we started using it, we realized this wasn't what they used. This was probably something used in daily life like for a razor or something like that. So we learned quite a bit about the actual implements they used. But also the other big surprise was the embalmer's board. When we made the replica, it was much more wide than would be necessary. It was almost four feet wide. And Winlock, who discovered it, had commented. He said, why they had it so wide he couldn't figure out. They must have had to stand on it even to work. Well, when we piled the matron on the mummy, we realized why the mummy mummification table had to be so wide. The matron doesn't go in nice neat columns. It mounds. And you needed the full width of that board to cover a mummy. So we learned quite a bit about the tools. The second area that we were interested in were the procedures, the surgical procedures that the embalmers used. And the one that everybody wondered about was the removal of the brain. From x-rays, we knew that they removed it via the nose. They broke the ethnoid bone, and then they removed the brain. But exactly how did they remove the brain? We originally thought that once we broke through into the cranium, we would use that long snaking instrument, look like a coat hanger almost, put it inside, and then slowly Pull, pull the brain out a piece at a time. This didn't work. What we ultimately had to do was have the cadaver on its back, put the instrument in, and then move it around and around for nearly 20 minutes until the brain was broken down, until it was almost like a liquid. Then, with the cadaver turned upside down, we put the instrument once more, pulled it out, and the brain ran out. So, almost certainly, that's the way they did it. They moved the brain, broke it, broke it down, turned the cadaver upside down until it ran out. We can't be 100% sure, but this is the way it certainly could have been done, and I think it was the way that in fact it was done. 
The third area we wanted to learn about was natrin. How much did they use and how did they use it? The first question was easily settled. It took 600 pounds of natrin to cover our body. So that's approximately how much the ancient Egyptian bomber needed for mummifying the human. The way we used it, after we covered the body in natrin, we left it in our little controlled room, humidity the same, temperature the same, for 35 days. At the end of 35 days, we were the first people in 2,000 years to see what an Egyptian embalmer saw when the mummy came out of nature. It looked very much like an Egyptian mummy. It was dry, fairly dry. The hands were dark brown, feet were dark brown. And by this time, it had lost one half of its body weight. So the mummy had dehydrated considerably, but not completely. There was still a little bit of moisture left in the bottom part of the mummy, where, for example, when the heart stops beating, the blood goes to the bottom. The only force is gravity affecting the blood. So that's where all the moisture is. So when we remove the natrin from underneath the mummy, from the area around the gluteus maximus, the posterior, there the natrin was like moist sand and hadn't fully done its job. So after 35 days, we decided to wrap the mummy, to have it wrapped just preliminarily and put it back in the room with no natrin at all, just in the warm, dry air. And we left it there for another three months. After this period, we took the mummy out, and then we did the final wrapping. Now, at this point, the mummy had lost some more weight, another 20 pounds, and it was now only one-third of its original body weight. The mummy had lost two-thirds of its body weight in water. When we did the final wrapping, we realized something we had never expected. When we tried to position the mummy's hands for the final wrapping in a royal posture, like this, we were unable to do it. The body, because it was now fully dehydrated, was too stiff. The skin was leathery, and we couldn't position the body as we wanted. Then we realized the ancient Egyptian embalmers probably didn't want to remove all the moisture. They wanted some moisture in, certainly for the royal mummies, which would be positioned like this. So after 35 days, when we had some moisture in the body, that's probably what the Egyptian embalmers wanted, so that they could position the body and then wrap it and let it do its final dehydration. Another reason why they wanted, they must have wanted a little bit of moisture left in the body was to remove the little packets of natrin that we put in the abdominal cavity. If the body had been completely dehydrated, there wouldn't be the flexibility by the incision to put your hand in and remove the packets. So one of the interesting things that we found was that the embalmer's goal was not 100% dehydration of the body through natrin, but a considerable amount of the moisture out, and then position it, and then wrap it, and then the rest of the moisture could be evaporated naturally through the bandages. My aspect of the mummy project is completed now, but there's still a lot more to be learned from the mummy. One of the things we did at the very end of the project was take cultures from the cranial area, from the abdominal area, and see what kind of results we got for bacteria, for viruses, for fungi. And they came back from the laboratories all negative. There was no evidence whatsoever of bacteria, virus, or fungi in, in the mummy, even after having been in the room, unembalmed and unembalmed cadaver for over three months. This was an interesting finding, and already we're getting scientists asking to study the mummy, to compare our mummy with ancient Egyptian mummies, to see just how effective the nature is in preserving tissues. So I think there's a lot more to be learned still from the Mummy Project.